So good morning and good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Rinki. I am a program manager in Microsoft Identity Engineering Developer Care Team. So today I will be talking about how to optimize authentication and authorization in our web APIs using Microsoft Identity Web or the Microsoft Identity Platform as well. So have a quick look on the agenda. Uh, we'll talk about the app topology. Uh, then followed with what Microsoft Identity Platform is and what are the libraries available. Then we'll see how token acquisition happens with these libraries, followed with a small demo. Then after that, we'll talk about the permission and consent framework. Again, a small demo on what incremental permission is. And then finally, we'll wind up with the best practices. So please feel free to ask any question on the chat if I'm not able to see it because I'll be sharing the screen. I will take it up uh, as soon as I finish the session. So, so let's talk about the app topology. To understand this, to access the data layer from any protected web hosted resources, which in other words we call APIs, right? Application needs to authenticate and authorize against few standard protocols, namely OpenID Connect and OAuth2 protocols. So once done, they can make calls to the secured APIs. Here we have taken example of Microsoft Graph API, which is a gateway to a huge amount of data uh, from different workloads, especially Microsoft M365 workload. So you can choose from a wide range of technologies available for building your apps. And Microsoft Identity Platform Foundation is actually based on this app topology. So let's see for what are the libraries available in Microsoft Identity Platform. Before that, what is Microsoft Identity Platform? It is a set of authentication services and open source libraries and application management tool with which application developers can build applications where users can log in with different identities, namely the work and school account, uh, the personal accounts, and even the social accounts, and then authorize access to secured web APIs, for example, Microsoft Graph APIs. All of the architectures here are based on industry standard protocol, that is OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. So Microsoft libraries, especially MSAL, is the best choice when you use Microsoft Identity Platform. Why? Because using MSAL for token acquisition ensures high level of resiliency and security from an identity standpoint for your application. So let's talk about authentication. So what is authentication? When your app is integrated with our libraries like MSAL, then what happens? It actually receives or requests for to few tokens from the Microsoft Identity Platform. This Microsoft Identity Platform is the SDS server. You can, uh, that's a security token server or AD or Microsoft Identity Platform. You can call it anything. So your application integrated with MSAL will receive few tokens, namely ID token, access token, refresh token, and then what will it do with those tokens? With ID token, whoever is the user who is trying to sign into your app will prove his or her identity with this ID token. And then with the access token, your application will make a call to the protected web hosted resource. Here it is Microsoft Graph API. So this call is nothing but the HTTP GET request and the access token is passed as a bearer token in the authorization header of that HTTP GET request to access this API. So now this API will validate this token and it will authorize access for your application to its resource. So again, we recommend MSAL or Microsoft Identity Web for token acquisition because this is the most resilient and secure library as of today in Microsoft Identity Platform. So being said that, if you already are on the older version of Microsoft Identity Platform libraries like ADAL, then it's always recommended that you move to MSAL. Being said that because MSAL comes with much more benefits over ADAL. Just like I said, you can authenticate a broader set of Microsoft identities, like you can use users with work or school accounts or personal accounts or social accounts and your users will get the best single sign on experience with the V2 endpoint or the MSAL library. And your user will be able to use incremental consent. We 
we'll just talk about incremental consent in the later part of the slides. Along with that, you can use conditional access. So in short, you benefit from continuous innovation in terms of security and resilience when you are on msal.net or Microsoft Identity web. So when to choose what? What is Microsoft Identity Web? We know MSAL is our library, right? But what is Microsoft Identity Web? It's a single surface API convenience layer that ties together the ASP.NET Core, its authentication middleware, and the MSAL library. So we get the benefit. It's a wrapper on top of MSAL.NET. So we get the benefit of MSAL.NET and also the token validation part when you use Microsoft Identity Web. And how to decide when to use what? So if you are on Azure AD and or Azure B2C and you are building a web app or web API or a daemon app and you are on ASP.NET Core, then go for Microsoft Identity Web. If you are just on .NET Framework or .NET Core, then you can use the hybrid model where we have msal.net extensions and Microsoft Identity Web. We will get the benefit of token caches, serializer and certificate loader. If you are building desktop application or mobile application, then msal.net is the best choice for you. Similarly, we have project templates when if you are creating new applications, then you should directly you use those project templates that will be easier. And if you are already on Adal or the older library, then we have all the guidance available for migrating to the latest libraries of Microsoft Identity Platform. Now, here, this uh, session is mostly concentrated on msal.net or Microsoft Identity Web, but msal is available in all these languages and platforms. Apart from msal Go, all are currently generally available. So let's understand how token acquisition happens in Microsoft Identity Platform. So let's start with an app. So what we need now, we need to log in and user and then I need to call an API on behalf of the user. So this is my application. This is the Microsoft Identity Platform or the AD server, and this is the Microsoft Graph API user endpoint. That's the main endpoint from where I'll get the user information, profile information of the user. So what is required now? So this application needs an ID token to identify the user and an access token to read the user's profile from this API on behalf of the user. So in what what will begin a private conversation with the user will begin initially even before it talks to the web API. And this is where a cookie stations the session starts. So this is the core of single sign on. So once the cookie session starts, the app will receive an ID token. This is how an ID token looks like. So this is the header claim of the ID token, which gives you uh, what is the token type, like this is JSON web token, what's, uh, what is the algorithm used, and the kid, kid is a, a string that specifies the thumbprint for the public key that can be used for uh, validating the token signature, and also the version from which the token has been emitted. From here, it's uh, the payload claim starts. So the payload claim has the issuer, Issuer, this is having the uh, Microsoft Online.com, that is the AD server URI, followed with the tenant ID, the tenant ID for which the user is being authenticated for. So this is that tenant ID. And if it is emitted, this ID token is emitted from the V2 endpoint, then this will be at the end of the URI. Similarly, we have the audience claim. So audience claim, in case of ID token, it is the application ID of the application which has been registered in the portal. So once you register your application in the portal, a unique identifier will be created. That is the app ID, and that is what the audience is here in case of the ID token. So this ID token has to, this value should be validated because the token should reject if it fails to match your app's app ID. Then we have the expiry and issued at time and not before time. And this portion talks about the user himself, the name of the user, his username, and what will uh, we use usually is this object ID, which is unique for that particular user in that particular tenant. This object ID dot TID 
will give the unique identification of the user who is trying to log in to your application. So when you validate the token ID token, this is something will help you validating the uh, identifying the user. So now ID token has done the auth authentication part. Now the app will receive an access token. So what is an access token? Access token looks something like this. We have al al always passed it with JWT.io or MS, but it is always recommended that you do not attempt to validate or read tokens for any API you don't own as a developer because tokens from Microsoft can use a special format that will not validate as a JWT. It may also be encrypted for consumer accounts like Microsoft accounts. So while reading tokens is beneficial for debugging purpose, we understand that, but it should not take dependencies on this on your code. So tokens are meant to be read and validated only by its audience. That is the API that is consuming it. So moving to the next slide. Now the app has been authenticated. It has an authenticated user and also an access token to call the API. So now the app will make a request to the API endpoint and in its authorization header of the get HTTP get request, it will pass the access token as a bearer token. Now it is the work of this API. Microsoft Graph API to validate the token, the parse the token and validate and make sure that the token is from the particular application who is uh, who is trying to access whether they can authorize or not. Once this API validates the token, it will authorize access to the application on behalf of the user. Let's look into a small demo. So this application signs in an user and then make a call to Microsoft Graph me endpoint to read the profile information of the user. This is an ASP.NET Core MVC application. Here I have used Microsoft Identity Web and also Graph SDK. So let me explain. By adding Microsoft Identity Web, I have enabled my application to sign in user from different identities, as I already said, from work or school accounts and if Microsoft personal accounts if needed. So in these two lines, what is happening? msal.net is actually connecting with OpenID Connect events to redeem the authorization code from the SP.NET Core middleware and then make obtaining the token from the token endpoint. So once the token is obtained, it is stored in in memory token cache. You can uh, for the use of the controller. You can also use distributed token cache where you'll get advantage of SQL Server cache or Redis cache, depending upon your application needs. Here for, uh, in this application, I have used, used in memory token cache. So now in these two lines, what we are doing, we are adding the support to Microsoft Graph. Here, the graph service benefits from the a optimized HTTP client management of ASP.NET Core in these two lines. Let's go to the controller now. If you see here in the controller, we are making a call to the Microsoft Graph API me endpoint where the user information resides. So for this call, I have defined the scope user.read. So user.read scope is what is needed for getting access to this me endpoint. Now, if in case the token cannot be acquired, then a challenge is attempted to resign in the user and the user have to consent to the requested scopes. These scopes are uh, declared expressively in this authorized for scope attribute. This is something in Microsoft Identity Web, which actually manages the incremental consent framework. So as and when the, an application needs to perform a functionality or re, uh, read a particular data from the particular resource, it will go ahead and request for that particular scope. So this is what is authorized for scope attribute, uh, which is a part of Microsoft Identity Web and it helps managing the incremental consent. We will talk about incremental consent in more details in the later part of the slide. And then let's see where I have declared the details of the application. Before going to this, let me take you to the portal. One second. 
So this is my application. I have registered my application in Azure Active Directory. And once I registered this application, application ID, which is the unique identifier of my application got created. This is what is needed. And the, the tenant ID, tenant ID is same for all applications residing in my tenant. This is my tenant name Rinky Cosmos, if you can see. So once I register this application, I'll go to the certificates and secret plate and create a secret for my application. Secret is nothing but the application password. It is not recommended to use client secrets for production apps. This is my test application. I'm using it for demo purpose. Hence, I'm using client secret, but it's always recommended that you go ahead and upload certificate for your production application. So once I have done that, let me go back to my application. Here I have declared the client ID or the application ID, the tenant ID, the client secrets. I'll delete this after this call because I'm not supposed to show this openly. And this is the authorization server. That's login.microsoft.com and my domain. Once I have declared all the application parameters, then I have to declare the graph API, I mean the API where I'm making the call to and the scope for it. So here is where the scope is declared. The user.read to read the profile information of the user. So if I run my application, and I sign in with an user to this application for the first time. Adele, for the first time, is trying to access this application. She will be prompted for this request. This is the request or the permission that is requested by your app when you declare user.read scope. So as a user, I am accepting this and I am signed in as Adele in this application. Now I'll try to hit the me endpoint of the graph API and that will give me the details of the user profile. So what we did here is we signed in a new user in my application using Microsoft Identity Web and then I made a call to graph API endpoint on behalf of the user and got to know the user profile information. So let's go back to the deck. OK, so what if my application needs to call another API? So I have got an access token for Graph API. Uh, now I need to call another API, which is named as Catalog API. So I cannot use the token that is issued for Graph for another API for obvious reasons. So I'll need an access token to read the catalog as a user. So now again, a private conversation will start similarly the application will receive another access token on behalf of the same user or different user. If it is a different user, then uh, again, we had, have to prove his identity. If it's the same user, Apple will receive an access token for this particular API. And then in a similar way, it will make a call to this API with the access token as a bearer token in the authorization header of the HTTP request. And then once this catalog API validates this token, it will give access to the uh, it will authorize access to the application on behalf of the user. So this is how token acquisition and uh, accessing API happens in Microsoft Identity Platform. So moving on to the permission and consent framework, which is another important aspect of Microsoft Identity Platform. So authentication, we just spoke about. Authentication is where the user proves its identity to the application. Now the user is connected to the apps with authentication. And then what is authorization? Applications that integrate with Microsoft Identity Platform follow an authorization model that gives the user and administrators control over how much data the app can access, either on behalf of itself or on behalf of a an user. Depending upon that, Microsoft Identity Platform has bucketized the permissions into two broad categories. The other delegated permissions and application permissions. And by consenting to these permissions, admins and users feel confident that their applications are not being used with any malicious intent. So 
what, what is this authorization model if you want to talk in detail? Then Microsoft Identity Platform implements the OAuth to authorization protocol for this model. Uh, this protocol is a method by which a third party app can access an API on behalf of an user. So API can define a set of permissions that as a developer, you can use to implement functionalities in your app in smaller chunks. So the API may expose any amount of data, but an app should request only for those which is required, only for those uh, permissions that are at most required for the application to function. So the recommendation is to always abide by the least privilege approach. Only ask for those that is absolutely required for my application to function. I should not ask for any permission for which I do not have any functionality in my application at all. So the recommendation is to abide by the law of least privilege approach. OK, so there are two types of permissions. So when an application accesses an API on behalf of an user, then uh, the permission which is required is termed as delegated permission. So for any application which has signed in user in front of it, for example, single page app, web apps, mobile or desktop app, and application with middle tier web API, for those kind of application, the permissions that will be required are delegated permissions. And as there is a signed in user present in front of this kind of application, these permissions can be consented either by the users or by the admin. And that is completely on the API developer on who can actually grant consent to these permissions. As an app developer, we are not worried about who can consent. If my application requires this permission, I'll go ahead and request for it. On the other hand, if an application accesses a service on behalf of itself, for example, service, backend services or daemon app, then the permission that is required are termed as application permissions. And as there is no signed in user in front of these kind of applications, so we uh, obviously only ad admin can consent for these kind of permissions. So now the intersection of delegated permission and application permission is what we call as effective permission. And that is the permission which an application has finally when it is making a call to the targeted resource. So a user will have some privilege or restriction depending upon the organization's tenant restrictions or rules, and an application will be granted consent for its permission, its range of operations, but the effective permission will be always the intersection of both of the type of permissions. So moving on to the next slide, how we call an API and how an app requests for, an, for a scope. We just saw in the demo, how we make a call to the token endpoint or with the scope with Microsoft Identity Web. So here, what we do is, we'll first try to acquire the token silently. And in case we receive an UI required exception, then we'll go ahead and acquire the token interactively. And the scope is defined as user or read when we need to read the, assign in the user and read the profile information of the signed in user. So for a regular user, if the permission requires user consent, not admin consent, then for a regular user, this is what the experience will be. He or she can accept or deny this permission, just as I did in my demo. So if a permission requires admin consent, then for a regular user, this will be the experience because uh, the regular user will not be able to consent for that particular permission. And if it is an admin user, then he or she will be able to accept the permission on behalf of it himself, or also he can consent on behalf of the entire organization. So this is very beneficial for LOB applications where an admin can consent on behalf of the organization and any users using the, this application will not be prompted again for the request. This can be done while running the application. This can be done from the portal also. If you go to the portal, you can click here and it will be uh, on behalf as an admin, then on behalf of all the users, the consent will be granted. Once 
the particular scope is accepted, then the app will receive an access token. So this is the access token. But if the user or our admin rejects the permission, then the app will not receive any access token and it will be said that a consent has been denied. So here what is happening? A basic transaction happens here that I'm asking for a token. Can I have an access token to call this API with a scope for a particular range of operations? The app, app's request is either granted or denied. Based on that, the app will receive a token or it will not. So again, permissions are of three types, like dynamic permissions, which is very new uh, to the V2 endpoint. Here the developer has control on what permissions the user will be prompted for which consent is required. Unlike the old experience where it was already defined in the portal. Suppose there are 10 permissions available in the portal, but my application needs only three or four of it. Then I'll go ahead and request only those three and four of it. I will not go ahead and request for all the 10 that is available in the portal. So this is what is dynamic consent, and this can be combined with incremental consent where what we do, we combine the dynamic consent with incremental user consent, which allows you as an application developer to add another consent on the way. For example, just to read the profile information, I need user dot read. OK, but in course of time, my application needs to set an invite on the user's calendar. For that reason, it has to go and ask for the user. Look, I need to get access to a calendar. Please give me access. If he gives access, then I can go ahead and put up an invite in his calendar. Then I need calendar.read write for that purpose. And again, after a few more days, I need to go and uh, manage the files in his OneDrive. My app, I means the application. So again, I'll go ahead and ask for that particular scope. So as and when the application needs to perform some functionality for which a particular scope is required, at that point of time, it can request for the scope. No need to go ahead and request for all the scope at the beginning of uh, signing in a user to that particular application. So this is what is incremental permissions. So this is how we make the request with in incremental consent uh, incremental permissions while making a call to acquire token. And the static permission, the final one which we already used with the older version of library also. This is the slash dot default. And here, what is happening? I want to use, means the application want to use everything that's already been declared in the port portal for me, and I'm not going to manage incrementally or dynamically the consent that my applications are going to use. So this is the slash dot default permissions. This is used for a uh, for daemon services or backend services where there is no sign-in user. So already whatever is available in the portal is what is available for that particular applications but it's not recommended for uh, where there is a signed in user present to use this kind of a permission. Let's do another small demo or understanding how incremental consent work. So this is an application developed by Kyle. Thanks to Kyle. And this is a desktop application where we are using Microsoft identity client that is msal.net. And we are making calls to three different Microsoft Graph APIs with three different scopes. OK, first is as we spoke about user dot read scope. So for this scope, API developer, API developer in the sense Microsoft Graph developers had designed the API in such a way that this permission does not require admin consent. How it is decided is based on how much data it is exposing. The user dot read uh, exposes low privileged data. It is exposing the information of the user on behalf of the signed in user. So it's a low privilege data. That's why the API developer has made the, this, the, this scope available for the users to give consent to. Admin consent is not required for this. Similarly, for uh, People API, this is an intelligent API, API from Microsoft Graph, and uh, this actually gives you the list of people you are currently interacting with. It has a relevant score based on which it determines whom you have recently shared a file with, whom you had recently contacted over Teams, or whom you 
chat with daily, who are your teammates you are working with closely, and with that relevant score, it provides a list of people. And uh, this API is useful for that purpose. So uh, if, when you try to type a name on the address bar of uh, the email, you will see that you will get a prompt of few people whom you are already working with. So that is where uh, this API comes into picture. Just an example. So even this API does not expose high privileged data. So for this API also admin consent is not required. Then we are making call uh, to the groups API and here we are requesting for a scope group dot read dot all which will allow uh, the application to read the all the groups information for all the users on behalf of the signed in user. So in this case, it is exposing a high privilege, higher privilege data, which might not be relevant for the signed in user to know. So that's the reason this particular permission requires admin consent, and that is how it is designed by the API developer. So with all these calls, we are actually making call to the graph endpoint with the access token and with the scope here. So let's run the application. Application is running, it seems. So when we try to sign in a user, I'll just sign out the current user. Again, we just saw that because user dot read, I have uh, uh, Adele is a regular user and she is trying to access this app, so this doesn't require admin consent. So she will get this kind of a prompt, and she'll be able to access the application. So now, if I, when I'm making the call to the people endpoint, again with the same user, along with reading the user profile, now that uh, the request is that. This is what is we call an incremental consent. Now the application is requesting for another consent that I uh, want to go and read the people information. Are you allowing me? So this this is what we call the incremental consent. If you see in my app here right now. The application permissions, you will see only the user dot read permission has been granted. It will keep on increasing as and when I go ahead and consent for the other requests. So now let me go to the result tab. You will you will be able to see the people information. This is a dummy application and I do not have so many relevance people whom which this dummy application has worked of, of which this user had worked with. So that's the reason I'm not seeing much details, but it is it has the capability of showing all the relevant people you are recently working with. So going back to the portal. Now you see people dot read is added to it, so it's incrementally adding all the permissions as and when it's required by the application. Let's make a call to the group API with the regular user. Now you see you will not be able to consent uh, means the regular user will not be able to consent for this permission because. This permission requires admin consent. This is a new experience where you can go ahead and request for approval. I want access. To. This resource. For example, you can go ahead and request for this and it will go and sit in the user consent. In your uh, portal. So but if I. Use an admin. To log in. Or uh, to make a call to this endpoint, I will be allowed to consent for it. See, I am an admin and I will be allowed to consent for it either on behalf of myself or on behalf of the entire organization. So this is how. Now if you see here. Groups will also be added to it, So this is what is incremental consent is. This 
this permission got added to it. So you see the uh, permissions are getting incrementally added. Initially, you do not require all the permissions. So that is what is incremental consent. In the interest of time, let me go back to the deck. Let's talk about few of the best practices of using Microsoft Identity Platform. So the golden rules for tokens. Use tokens only for their intended functions. Do not try to use a token which is intended for a particular resource for another resource. ID tokens identify the user to the application. Access tokens authorize the apps for a range of operations for an API. Never mess with someone else's token. Apps do not look at the access token. As we already discussed, you are not supposed to parse an access token and look into it if you are not the one who is consuming it. APIs never use ID tokens for authorization. APIs never accept access tokens for other APIs. And cache tokens appropriately use proper token caches for storing the tokens. MSAL handle this automatically, so it is always recommended that you use MSAL or, or Microsoft Identity Web, which does all this at the back end for you, and you do not, do not have to worry. Check the error classes instead of search for specific error codes. So now the best practice for single sign on. Always try to acquire the token silently before at attempting the interactive token acquisition. We spoke about these two in few slides above. This is the simple pattern that enables SSO and handles IT policies. So best practices for secure at authentication. Build your solutions by using libraries as we said, MSAL and .NET middleware. Do not store login names and passwords. Use MSAL or B2C. Apps shouldn't handle raw passwords. Avoid the resource owner password credentials. Confidential clients like demons and web services should use certificates. As we said, we should not be using client secrets. Maintain redirect URI hygiene for your application. We have a blog talking about uh, the hygiene, how we can use redirect URI in an appropriate way. You can go through this for more details. And we have an article for the best practices also. Please look into it if you're interested. So best practices for updating to MSAL. So write your new apps using MSAL or Microsoft Identity Webs. If you are already on Adal, if you are already on Microsoft older version of library, then it's uh, recommended that you move to MSAL and uh, that will make your application more resilient to any of the outages that is happening and more secure. We have the guidance available for all the platforms, all the languages and the platforms. You can choose depending upon on which platform you're building your app. So the next steps. Thank you, Rinki. Uh, thanks a lot for the, the session. Uh, the next steps, folks, uh, you know, go to aka.ms slash MSID platform, you know, get started there. And we have our monthly community call every third week, Thursday. Uh, you can download the calendar and pretty much, uh, you know, join all our calls. We have some exciting uh, calls lined up for the upcoming months. You can always ask a question uh, in the, you know, Stack Overflow Microsoft Identity uh, category. All right, so this recording will be available in uh, Microsoft 365 PNP slash videos. You can get the full schedule of the upcoming sessions and all the recordings on these Twitter channels. Please uh, do a follow and we have our next call coming up on April 21st. Like I said, exciting calls lined up and uh, you know we would love to have you here and it would be great if you could take some time to not take more than a minute to you know fill in a survey for us. But I do see there are some questions on uh, the chat. Let me see. All of them are answered. I see Kyle taking up a lot of them. OK, for the single sign off, I think one question is there. Yeah, go ahead. But I will be sharing you the link for uh, the single sign off. We have not covered it in this session. The interest of time, but I'll be sharing the link here. Hello, this is Ernest. I, I think Kyle answered my question, but I think I still have a question, right? Um, and I would like to clarify my question, right? Um, which has to do sure. with administrative consent 
for specific application permissions for specific APIs that are federated on the tenant, right? Uh, I'm part of the team that is basically the director administrator, so global administrators of the tenant, and we get a lot of requests from our application teams to consent to API specific permissions, where again, the director admins don't have a clue what those grant. The owner of the API is the one that knows uh, what those grant to the API, right? This is a custom build API, of course. Um, so there's no UI today for application owners. So folks that are granted the owner role on the application registration to grant admin consent to their own scopes, right? You can do that via PowerShell. We kind of documented that internally and are sharing that every time we get one of those, but we still get a lot of those because you know, app owners, developers don't know how to do that via PowerShell, right? So the question is, is there any plans to you know, build a UI on the portal where admin consent for specific applications can be granted by the application owner, not the director administrator? Okay. If I understand uh, that for your custom APIs, whatever scope yep. you're exposing, mm -hmm. for example, if Correct. you can see my screen. Yep, those. That's, yeah, that's exactly okay. that Yep. If this is my custom API and I have added these permissions here. Mm -hmm. So as an administrator, I can grant consent for my tenant. Well, I'm talking here. about application permissions, right? That okay. require an yeah. consent, right? Okay. So those those that you added there are delegated and don't require an consent. Okay. Got it. So yeah. all application permissions, regardless of the API, require an consent, right? Yeah, yes. I think that's fair feedback that we have a way for, mm -hmm. you know, because right now you would go to the admin consent endpoint, but I think we would need an admin to sign in there, not a user, uh, not an application yeah. owner. So you could make someone an app owner here, which in theory should give them uh, the right to go ahead and, well, you actually app owner, we would need an application administrator role to, to mm -hmm. be able to grant these admin consent to uh, something not other really. than Microsoft Graph. So you, you can use PowerShell to do it, right? Okay, As with a, with an even app owner. owner access here, yes. Okay, correct. But, but not, we, not, not a UI, right? But that's right. But when you yes, go to the the admin consent endpoint, I think we need admins to sign in there. So I think that's f fair feedback that we don't have. You can do it with mm -hmm. PowerShell. You can do it with your own uh, use of Microsoft Graph. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. But correct. we don't have a UI built for that. So I think it's. It's good feedback for us to take uh, as we look at, you know, improvements we can make to, to this area of the AP, of the UI. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for the feedback. Um, it was only a, a quick question I'd put into the um, chat there. Um, so for, for systems where we need finer grained details, um, so maybe not suitable for going into a token, um, it's like an ABAC style approach. Um, is that something that you can see fitting into this framework? Would you say that there was any sort of preferred ways of implementing that? We don't have any guidance for that today, although it's certainly looking uh, like it, it's certainly something we're investigating right now uh, and, and what kind of, of ABAC systems and so on. Today, we don't have any specific guidance. Um, all we have today is that the token you know, will apply, especially you know, obviously in the resource provider, the API implementation side. You know, we can get the token to your API, obviously, via the, the client app, but we don't provide yet tools for how you can go to that next step, especially when you start thinking about, okay, how do I actually do effective permissions? How do I know what this user is allowed to do, et cetera? We're looking at how we can plug into those systems or, or, or uh, provide something. We just don't have any generic guidance at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Colin. There is a question here uh, about the use of AS Web Authentication Session. Um, my concern is that when asking that you're 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 going ahead and doing the protocol level work on your own. I would prefer to use to see you use MSOL uh, in that situation since we have work in MSOL to do things well there. There are issues around things like uh, especially now that Azure AD PDC does have conditional access support. Uh, there's issue as around timing and making sure all those things work, uh, background tasks, etc. Given the specific uh, architecture in uh, iOS today, there's there's issues with uh, you know background worker tasks, etc. Uh, that are going on that need to be going on. The only advice I would give you is if you want the you know our best practices, if you will, we don't really talk about this. Uh, 
uh, implementing things at the protocol level is something we think should be your last resort. You should use MSOL if you're targeting uh, Microsoft Identity as you are with Azure B2C. Otherwise, a, a well-maintained OpenID Connect library would probably have these items solved. Uh, the only guidance I can have with re within to, you know, what ha is to look at our MSOL implementation, MSOL iOS, it is open source. We have all of that source available and take a good solid look at how we're using that AS web authentication session. There are definitely some gotchas in that respect, as I mentioned, especially depending upon the time frame that a uh, an OpenID Connect request can happen given conditional access uh, requirements that needing to be met, where I have seen developers who are off trying to do their own protocol uh, implementation have to do some extra work because of the nature of how iOS puts your session, you know, and start, start starving your session for cycles. Uh, there's definitely some work there you need to look at. So take a look at the MSOL iOS uh, for how we do that. Thanks, Marsh. We'll do that. I wasn't sure why, uh, why or how this was implemented before, so I'm just I'm getting new under the project. So probably I'll, I'll find out more about this. Yeah, um, it is tricky. I will I will say that right because it's it's very iOS specific, by the way, right? It's how iOS deals with when you're it's because especially when you're using the the the, the, uh, the broker etc. It's definitely something you should take a look at in in our source. Okay, thank you. There's one more question. Is there a place that you users can see a list of what they have consented to? Sure, they can go to myapps.microsoft.com. For either your corporate or personal accounts, you can get a sense, a, a list, if you will, and you could even go in and revoke those permissions or revoke consent. If, if you had granted it, you can revoke it for there too. Perfect. There's another question on how do the admin owner provide consent using PowerShell? I think we have a doc for this, right? Yeah, I assume I haven't looked at it myself, though, but I think that was something that uh, Carlo uh, uh, mentioned, so maybe he has a pointer to the doc for us, if he's still here. Uh, question. Uh, I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into that uh, that discussion that was later uh, earlier with the admin owner that is able to provide admin consent is that really true because that would, in my mind would be a huge security risk as I'm, I'm, an as an administrator i'm definitely not interested in the developer to decide which data he's he's granting access to ah so uh here's some different things uh, first okay. off, for any Microsoft Graph API, a tenant admin is the only in, uh, only uh, role person who's allowed to grant a consent to admin consent required items in Microsoft Graph because of the nature of the data that you're getting access to. The the tech the, the it's not actually a, a developer. The application owner role doesn't give you the right to grant permission uh, to your client application. However the application owner role for the API, uh, that application owner could grant permission uh, to, to, you know, they're, they're allowed to grant permission to request to that particular API, but that particular API only. Oh, um, okay. so, so in this okay, case, so, if that okay, so. individual is the same, right? Although I would actually point out, uh, Ricky, could you bring up the, the app registration uh, API registration page. If I was sure. really doing this, I'm developing uh, the close an API it's page. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But here we have the ability to add, as as you see here, add a client application. So if I'm really the owner of the API and I'm the an owner of that application, it sounds to me like I have a close coupling between the front and the back end here, and that's really what this is meant to pervade. Right, I've got a, a. I can add my client application to my app, AP, my API registration, and say this client application shouldn't need consent. Effectively saying these two uh, are closely coupled. So if I really was the API API owner and the application owner, I'd probably use this. Okay, so it's only consent to the data within that particular API. Yes, exactly. It's yeah, not and, and access to the backend data. Not to the, yeah, the, certainly not to anything in Azure AD. Specifically, the Azure AD part of Microsoft Graph requires tenant admin to consent because of the nature of what that 
could be, right? So as you were concerned, hey, I don't want some random application granting itself access to tenant admin capabilities at Microsoft Graph. We, we wouldn't like that either, right? So that's not allowed. If you have a Microsoft Graph where all of your directory information is, where all of your information from Microsoft 365 is, those require real tenant admins, like global tenant admins to approve, to grant. Yeah, so it's you, the administrator cannot say, okay, now I want my API to have access to all emails in all mailboxes, for instance. Not the app admin. It would have to. That would require a tenant admin. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and that was my question, right? Me, I'm a tenant admin. I don't want to be approving API scopes for specific apps. Like, when, if you if you go here to the, uh, what is it? Uh, app roles, right? where you define what scopes you want for your API. Uh, and I, I don't know what those are, right? For each and every yeah. API app on the tenant. So yeah. I don't, and, as, and I admin shouldn't as, be approving that. Yeah, as you mentioned, we'll let you off the hook for that for you, these custom APIs. We won't, won't let you off the hook yep. for that as a tenant admin for Graph. I, I completely agree with that, right? <laughs> we, we control that and we you know, tightly manage who gets those accesses, yes. Course. Yeah, <laughs> that would be a huge security concern as just mentioned. Exactly, before. you're the only people who can grant that permission, right? Yeah, only GAs can do that, and nobody else. Yes. Yep. And, and as Kyle said, uh, this is where you can go ahead and revoke permissions from your my my apps, manage your accounts, uh, manage your applications. I do not uh, for this one. I do not have anything, uh, but you can always go ahead and revoke permissions from it. From the my apps. So thank you, everyone. Any other questions? We are on time. We have one more question uh, with Owen and MSR Lotted. When user authentication expires, cookie expires, uh, the cookie authentication handle will force the user to go to OIDC login flow. Are there any thoughts for an extension where MSR token cache could be checked for a refresh token being valid? And using that re relogging the user, avoiding the redirect slash white flashes in the browser. The problem there is, the, you know, effectively two different components doing the work there. Um, the always so, and you know, to a certain extent, I guess we're showing a little bit of organizational structure. The msol.net, uh, you know, we we provide, but the ON is part of uh, uh, .NET Core itself or .NET, right? So, the the fact that you know you've gone ahead and done an authentication with msol uh, to get access tokens, well, the uh, which which can have refresh tokens, uh, the 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 core .NET component isn't aware of. So I don't think we have any plans to change that. That would be something that we look at through the Microsoft Identity at Web that Rinky had talked about earlier. Yeah. Perfect. I think we are good. I think we have covered all the questions. Thanks a lot, Rinky. Thanks a lot, Kyle. And thank you everyone for joining. If you could take a minute to fill in the survey, that would be really helpful. Our next call is going to be on April 21. Looking forward to all of you on the call. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Nandish. Thanks, Kyle. Have a nice day, all of you. Bye-bye.